Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Hope everybody's doing well out there. I know uh, those of us in the US, we're getting ready for Thanksgiving tomorrow. We're gonna go eat way too much food with people we don't normally hang out with. And uh, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. I'm excited about it. Gonna go hang out with my family uh, near Charlotte, North Carolina, and that's gonna be a really good time. And uh, I like turkey. I know some people don't like turkey. I actually like turkey. Uh, maybe your people don't make good turkey. I don't know how to help you with that. But uh, yeah, so anyway, happy Thanksgiving to those of you in the U.S. Outside the U.S., happy normal Wednesday. And uh, yeah, so we are on week two of our Effects on Violin series that we started last week. This being week two, we did start last week. That's how that works. And the gist of this series is that we are going to be talking about a different effect each week. Uh, so last week, um, well, for, let's let's say this. For each week, for each effect, we will give general information about that effect. What is it? You know, if we're talking about reverb, what the heck is reverb? We will talk about some common parameters for that effect. And we will talk about some examples of uses of that effect on strings, on, on uh, specifically amplified strings. And some of these weeks, we're going to have guest artists that we talk to. This is one of those weeks, excited. And uh, so, yeah, I've already got a bunch of guests lined up for this sort of thing. I'm stoked. I get to hang out with a bunch of my friends and talk about cool stuff. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Last week, we talked about gain structure. Gain structure is not technically an effect, but it's one of those things that if you don't get it right, it doesn't matter what you do with your effects. Uh, so gain structure is really important. We got to make sure that we get our full dynamic range and tone through each of our effects pedals into our amp, into the front of house board. All those things are super important. And we have to manage that through the whole signal chain. EQ is a little bit similar to gain structure. Gain structure is referring to the entire signal that's going through your signal chain. EQ is managing the gain of each specific frequency or frequency range within that signal. So it's a little bit similar to gain structure, also very important. Uh, our guest this week said, uh, you'll hear a little bit later, that he said that it's kind of like the oil change entire rotation of effects. It's one of those things, it's like not super sexy, but if you don't get it right, it's uh, you're not gonna be happy with what happens. What is, is something on my face? It's weird, I don't know. Anyway, maybe there's some, some weird camera thing going on. Look like I'm jaundiced, but only on one side. Um, this week, EQ, in order to understand EQ, we're gonna have to do a little bit of science. I know it's not a physics class, but uh, we'll, we'll keep it a little bit simple, but I want you to understand a little bit about the science of this so that if you understand the why, you'll know the what. Does that make sense? A lot of people will hit me up and go, dude, just listen, I just wanna know what settings to put on my EQ so my violin sounds good. I'm like, I can't do that for you. It's like asking me to tell you, well, um, hey, I have this house. What furniture should I put in it? I'm like, I don't know anything about your house. I don't know how big it is. I don't know what your budget is. I don't know how many people hang out there. Like, I don't know if you like Art Deco or I, I don't know any. I don't know enough to answer that question for you. And not being in your house, I, I can't help you. So it's the same thing with EQ. I can't give you settings. I can teach you how to use those settings and then you will know what to do for yourself. So if I teach you the why, you'll know the what. Rob Flax, my man. Yeah, if you tried turning it off and turning it on again. My face? Yeah. If I could turn my face off, we would all have a better day than we're having right now. So yes, yeah, part of the science behind this, I'm gonna compare sound to light, okay? That sounds a little weird, but with both sound and light, we use organs to perceive a band of frequencies that we are being bombarded with. Um, and with light, we perceive some of those frequencies as different colors. The different frequencies we perceive as different colors. Low frequencies we perceive as red. High frequencies we perceive as violet. Has ever occurred to you that there's no such thing as green? Like it's not a thing. Like we perceive it as green just because that's how our photoreceptors in our eyes work. But like green light and blue light, they're, they're not actually different. They're just different wavelengths of the same thing. So it is our perception 
that, uh, wow, that's really trippy. Anyway, I'm not even high. Wow. So here's the visible spectrum. Uh, and it goes, you can see that the frequency range there, and you can see how our eyes perceive those different colors. It's a very similar thing going on with audio. It, we can perceive from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz when we're born. Those of us that play loud rock and roll cannot hear 20 kilohertz anymore. Um, I'm more like a 14 to 15 guy, um, and that's fine. There's not a ton of useful information thank goodness, between like 15 and 20 kilohertz, it's there. Um, I can actually kind of sense if it's not there, but I can't, like if there's something crazy going on in those frequencies in a mix, sometimes you can go, ah, I can't really hear it, but something's telling me that it's not right. Um, but anyway, we can perceive sound in this range. Now here's the thing, with visual, if we're talking about the color map that we can see, We've got lots and lots and lots of words for colors. There are dozens and hundreds of words for colors. We don't have that many words for sounds. So think about that, especially in English um, or Spanish, either one of those. We don't have a lot of words to describe sounds. And we end up using shapes and colors and textures. We'll say, you know, I want it to be round or I want it to be warm or I want it to be fuzzy or I want it to be clear. <coughs> Excuse me. But... We don't have a lot of good words. And sometimes it creates a problem where I want to communicate something to somebody about, oh, what does it sound like? Well, you know, it's thin or it's bright or it's crispy. I don't have good words for that. So one of the things you guys might want to do a screenshot here. This is a chart that I found online that talks about some of the frequency ranges that we can perceive as people and maybe some words that we could use to describe what's happening in those frequency ranges. And you see on the far column there where it's a caution because with, with frequencies, all of these things are a double-edged sword. We talked last week about gain. We've got the Goldilocks issue, right? We don't want too much gain. We want too little gain. We don't want too little gain. We want just right. And it's like that with EQ in every frequency range. So it's not just gain by itself it's gain in every single frequency range. So uh, for example, um, I don't know, say maybe around 500 Hertz. Uh, you can see here we got 500 Hertz. That's where you've got some uh, sort of texture and honk and horn. That's that's where you're gonna have, yeah, yeah. to me it's that, it, it sounds like 500 Hertz is what it sounds like. Um, but if you've got too little of that, it's gonna sound sort of hollow or transparent, if you sound, if you have too much, it's gonna get real honky. Um, not that kind of honky, like like a horn, like a goose honky. Um, so each of these is a double-edged sword. If you don't have enough, then it's gonna be bad. If you have too much, it's gonna be bad. And we have to find the right, um, the right amount of gain in each one of these frequency ranges for us to have a pleasing sound. And it can be a little tricky it's one of the things that's super, super important. It takes a long time to figure out how to do this stuff. And there's not really a shortcut. It's kind of like learning the violin. Hey, can you just kind of tell me how to do it? I can tell you how to do it, but it's not going to help you do it. So one of the things that you're going to have to do if you want to use EQ well is you're going to have to put in the time. You're going to have to sit there with your instrument and listen to what happens if you change different frequencies. I will give you some, some ideas to kind of get you started, but you're gonna have to put in the time, okay? There's, there's not any shortcuts to this. I wish there were, there just aren't. Now, from a visual standpoint, a lot of times we're used to seeing this chart right here. This is from Logic, where on the, the horizontal axis we have frequency, low frequency on the left, high frequency on the right. And then on the vertical axis, we have amplitude, which is how loud that signal is. So, you know, at the bottom left corner are the super low frequencies. And then, you know, if, if you go up, that means that those super low frequencies are getting louder. In the mid, that's so those middle frequencies. If they're down at the bottom, they're quiet. If they're at the top, they're louder. You understand what's going on. Just to make sure we're all on the same page with terminology, frequency, which we might call like pitch, 
is measured in hertz, which is cycles per second. Um, so if I say a high frequency or a low frequency, you can think like a high pitch or a low pitch. Uh, and then there's a two to one relationship. Any, any two frequencies that are at a two to one relationship, we would call an octave. So the open A on your violin, we would generally be tuned to 440. So the open A would be 440. First finger on the G string, an octave below that would be 220. And then third finger on the E string, which is an octave above open A, would be 880. So if you're trying to remember, like, oh, how am I going to remember all these frequencies? Really, if you can sort of remember one band of frequencies, then half of that is the octave down, double that is the octave up, and that's going to help you. Amplitude uh, is strength, and that is measured in decibels. And decibels are logarithmic. So 50 dB has double the sound power of 40 dB. Okay, now I almost got way into the woods. I was making a bunch of slides up for this yesterday, and I had like 40 slides after this with all kinds of stuff. Don't worry, I don't have 40 slides today. I threw most of them out. Um, I think it's super interesting, but I don't want to get too much into the weeds here because I, I want to make sure we're getting to the EQ question rather than getting too deep into exactly how the human ear works and how measuring sound works and all that. I would like to eventually do a video on that. Um, it might be super nerdy. But basically just sound power, if we double the sound power, then we go up by 10 dB. That does not mean that you are hearing it, perceiving it as twice as loud. It means that it's double the sound power. Now, just as an aside, to go from 40 dB to 50 dB requires 10x as much power. So if I've got, if I've got one violin who's playing at 80 dB, if I get nine of his buddies that can all play at 80 dB, they will sound 90 dB. So you're like, wait, 10 violinists generate double the sound power. Yes. Yes, that's true. So it's a very, very weird thing. Um, and does it sound twice as loud? Uh, it depends on who you ask. But anyway, we will get into that in some other video. Just understand that dB is logarithmic. So if you see like, oh, well, you know, 50 dB, that's not much louder than 40 or 90 is not much louder than 80. Oh, yes, it is. It's like way, way, way louder. All right. So EQ, what is EQ? E, you know, we're what? Uh, we are 14 minutes in to an EQ video. and We're going to talk about what EQ is. Sorry, maybe I should have put this first. EQ is changing the amplitude of a frequency or a range of frequencies and we use it for sculpting our tone. So it, I would say EQing or equalizing something. If I turn up uh, 200 hertz, I am EQing that. Or if I'm turning down 200 hertz, I am EQing that. I'm not turning the whole signal down. Like 50 hertz is still popping right where it was. 5K is still popping right where it was, but that 200 hertz is coming down or going up that changes the overall balance of what I'm hearing or equalizing. Um, and we can see that with light. If we do a light comparison, you guys have seen on a, on a photo editor, you've got the RGB sliders, right? Red, green, blue. And if I turn up the green, like the tint of that whole thing changes. It doesn't get brighter or darker. It just gets more greener, if that makes sense. <coughs> um, yeah, Sasha, that's a great point. That 100 watt amp isn't twice as loud as a 50 watt amp. It's it's actually only about three dB louder. Um, the tools in EQ, uh, we have kind of three main tools. We have uh, a pass filter, like a low cut or high cut, and I'll show you some diagrams here in a second. There are bell filters, and I'm very proud of that. My family invented that. No, we didn't. And then there are shelf filters. Uh, and I'll show you a graphic on each of those. This is what a high cut and a low cut look like. So the low cut is also known as the high pass filter because if you cut the low frequencies, it means the high ones are passing. So those two terms are used interchangeably. I wish it wasn't like that, but it is. Uh, and then there's the high cut where we're cutting all the high frequencies and allowing the low frequencies to pass. Now you can see that these are not brick walls. It's more of a roll off. 
and that's just how these filters work without getting into the math of how all this happens. Um, it is a roll off. So if I set my low cut or my high pass filter, if I set it at 200, I will still hear some 150. So you're like, wait, I've cut everything below 200. Yeah, but it's not a brick wall. It's a roll off. So, and then same thing with my high cut with my low pass filter. I can, I can low pass it at 6K. I'm still going to hear some 8K. It's going to be cut down quite a bit. But again, it's not a brick wall. It's a roll off. Um, so those are things to keep in mind. So here's your high cut and your low cut or your high pass and low pass. This is what the bell filter looks like. And that's why it's called a bell filter. It looks like a bell curve. Um, again, not my family. Sorry. I wish I was collecting royalties on this, but I'm not. So we can adjust on a parametric EQ. We can adjust how wide this filter is. This is a wide cut. This is a narrow cut. So if we want to kind of scoop out quite a bit of stuff in the high mids of something, so it's maybe it's a little honky, we're going to scoop out quite a bit of high mids in here and make it a nice gentle cut so that we don't hear, it doesn't sound like somebody's just really just removed a very specific frequency from there. And it sounds, wow, that's strange. Um, then, then that would be kind of a nice gentle wide cut. This one would be more specific. Say I've got a feedback issue or I've got a room that just particularly really resonates at a, at a certain frequency, maybe at a thousand hertz. This room just, man, this room is really problematic in that frequency. I might want to make a fairly narrow cut there so that I leave as much of my signal as I can and, and I will and then just be cutting some of that. Um, let me come back. To this question right here, is the bell filter the mids? Uh, in this particular um, thing, yeah, that would be high mids there. Um, so, yeah, we'd be kind of in the high mids here. Um, but, you know, you can use the bell filter goes anywhere. This is what we would call a sweepable uh, filter which means I can sweep the frequency from all the way down at 20 hertz to all the way up at 20 kilohertz. Um, and it will depend on which piece of equipment you're using. Some of these, maybe you've got, you might have a low pass and a, and a high pass, and then you've got maybe two bands in the middle where I've got a high mids and low mids, and they can only sweep a very narrow range. Um, <coughs> but that's, that's a, that's a way that we can, uh, your, no, so your bell filter can be used in theory, can be used anywhere. Your particular equipment that you're using might limit how much access you have to the entire frequency range. Does that make sense? So here on Logic, I can sweep this thing from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. If you're using a, um, I'm looking over here at the bags, uh, the bags, DIs and all that, they've got some sweepable mids on them, but it's a limited range of frequencies that they can sweep. Um, then there are shelf EQs. So I've got, I've got my roll offs high and low. I've got the bell filter and then I've got shelves and you can see that there's kind of a difference between a shelter and a high pass or a low pass. The shelf filter is just going to, it's going to boost or cut everything below or above a certain frequency, but it's not like, it's not dishing it all the way out. So here's your, here's your shelf. And then here is your high pass. See sort of the difference between those. So a shelf would be like if I want to, if in this particular situation where I've got a high cut, a high shelf cut, maybe this whole thing is just a little bright. The room we're in is a little bright. Maybe the recording is a little bright. I need to dull this down a little bit. It's kind of like, it would be almost like turning the tweeter down a little bit on that. I'm not cutting it all the way out. I'm just turning it down a little bit. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, a lot of you are saying, okay, that's great. He's got a parametric EQ on his DAW. That's wonderful. When I'm live, I don't have that. I've got one of these, uh, which I think everybody, I think when you start playing amplified music, one of these just shows up at your house. It's, it's uh, like if you have a baby, all of a sudden plastic toys just start appearing out of nowhere in your house. My kids had all these plastic toys that I didn't buy and my wife didn't buy. I have no idea how they got there. They just, I guess they just appear in the house. One of these has probably appeared in your house if you're playing 
uh, amplified music. And that's good. Uh, that's good. It's super useful. This is called a graphic equalizer. And so, okay, well, what's happening with this versus what's happening with that parametric EQ? This is what's happening with that. Each one of those faders, each one of those little sliders is taking a slice of this frequency spectrum and it, and you can either boost or cut. And that's what's happening if you boost the 800 or you cut the 400. There's a, a Q or a bandwidth that's there. And um, that's that's what that filter is doing. When, when you adjust those little sliders up and down, this is what it's doing to your frequency curve. All right. Now, we are going to have a discussion. We have a special guest. I actually recorded this conversation on Monday. So I'm going to play this for you in just a second. But before we get to my chat with Timothy, uh, I've got a couple of general principles for EQ. Um, and this is a joke, by the way. Don't send me any nasty emails. EQ is like voting. You want to do it early and often. Um, so EQ, we want to EQ early. And then we want to EQ as often as we can inside our signal chain. And that doesn't mean that you put one of those GE7s as every other pedal. A lot of times a given pedal will have a tone knob on it or a cut or a boost on it. Uh, but say if we're using a, uh, a chorus pedal, it's going to add some artifacts to your sound. And you may want to boost or cut those artifacts. But make sure you're boosting or cutting those artifacts because you're going to be sending that to the next pedal. And say if your next pedal is a distortion pedal, you want to make sure that you're feeding the signal to your distortion pedal that you want it to have. And then after your distortion pedal, you're probably going to have to EQ again because distortion pedals add a bunch of high frequency stuff. And then maybe they didn't add enough for you or maybe they added too much for you. But in any case, you're going to want to do some EQ at almost every step in your signal chain. And that's fine. Don't, don't be like, well, I had this EQ pedal at the beginning of my chain, so when I get to my amp, I just need to leave it flat. No, you can EQ and you can EQ 50 times in your signal chain and it's gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. Your engineer is gonna EQ one more time at his end or her end also. So yes, EQ is like voting, do it early and often. You wanna use it before some effects to get the right signal in. Uh, so I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, yeah, Timothy will talk about these in the video in a second. The second general principle, you want to high pass as high as possible. And Timothy will talk about why this is, but generally you want to run that high pass filter up as high as you can. And, and you want to dump as many low frequencies as you can, uh, no more than you can, but as many as you can. What I typically do is I will start playing and then I will sweep that high pass up until I hear it cutting into my sound in a way that I don't like. And then I will back it off just a little bit. But cut as much as you can out of the bottom end. Cut as much as you can in the middle and on the top. We want to cut as much as we can. We want to cut first and boost last. Uh, the reason is, <coughs> if I'm trying to boost frequencies, I'm using a little amplifiers in there and those amplifiers are going to add artifacts. Cutting can be done very, very cleanly. Boosting cannot. So we want to cut as much as we can. And you're like, wait a minute, Matt. What if I want more mids in my signal? Would I just boost my mids? No. What I would do first is I would cut lows and cut highs. So if I've got you know three equal size blocks, I can either raise the middle block or I can cut the two on either side, and it still has the same effect of making that middle one taller than the other two. Does that make sense? So cutting is your friend. Boosting is not your friend. You boost only when you must. Um, but yeah, cutting is, is very much more your friend than boosting. Don't boost unless you absolutely have to. Use reference recordings. If you're trying to get a specific sound for your violin, say you're like, hey, that Rob Flax, his fiddle always sounds amazing. Let me listen to some Rob Flax, and then I'm going to listen to my fiddle, <coughs> and I'm going to say, gee, I really need to practice more. But I will also say, wow, Ross is, or Ross, Ross also a cool guy. Rob's fiddle has, it's got more brilliance than mine. That means I need more highs, uh, which generally means I'm going to cut some other stuff. I'm going to cut lows and mids, which is going to create more highs in my signal as a, as a ratio. So I'm going to listen to a, a sound that I really like, and then I'm going to try to match the EQ 
by sculpting my signal. And the thing is your ears are really easy to fool. So using reference recordings is gonna help you, you know, cause we don't have good ways to describe sounds. Uh, use it, just trust me, use a reference recording. Look at an RTA if you don't have one. RTA, let me grab my phone if it's here. I don't even know where my phone, here it is. An RTA, you can get an RTA app on your phone. And an RTA is a real time analyzer. And what this does is it will show you on a plot like we're used to seeing frequency. This is low frequency. This is high frequency. This is, um, this is amplitude. And you can see in real time what the sounds that are coming. Can you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? My RTA can, and it will show you what's happening. Now we've got the air conditioner running in here because we're in North Carolina. So all this low frequency garbage down here, see, how, like we don't need any of that. You can't hear any of that. So if I were EQing my voice, I would cut all this out. It's just garbage anyway. And it's muddying up my signal. It sucks up a ton of power that I'm trying to use if I'm trying to broadcast this somewhere. So I would cut all this stuff out. And then maybe if, you know, I've got kind of a raspy voice, you can see a lot of this stuff up here. So that rasp that's happening up here, we might want to smooth that out and make me sound a little bit less like a smoker, even though I'm not a smoker. So those are all things. Use an RTA if you don't have one. So this can help you see the things that you're training your ears to hear. The other thing is there's no shortcut. Like I said, you've got to learn to do this. It took you years to learn to play your instrument. It could take a long time to learn how to hear all these different frequencies. But once you do, you won't be able to unhear them. Excuse me. That was a really good lunch. So experiment. Turn up the lows and see what happens. You're not going to break anything. Turn down the lows and see what happens. You're not going to break anything. I've given you some general principles. All these principles have been violated by people who know what they're doing. It's fine. You can violate the rules if you want. Uh, just experiment and see what happens. The next thing I want to talk, we're going to get to our video with Timothy Ha. Huh? Timothy's a fantastic dude. He's a studio player. He's a live player. He's got years of experience messing with this. And when you listen to him start talking, you'll be like, oh yeah, this is a guy who spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. And he very much has. So Timothy may actually be here in the chat with us. Uh, I don't know if he was able to make it today or not, but if we, we, this video is going to be about 25 minutes and it's going to have some examples. I put some examples in this video of when he's talking about low passes and high passes and different frequencies that are doing different things with violin, you're going to hear, I'll put an example of, of actually manipulating those frequencies. I think this part's going to be really helpful on the YouTube version of this video. I split these out. So where I'm talking, what I just talked about for the last few minutes, that's one video. And then my conversation with Timothy is another video. When I'm done with this video with Timothy in about the next 20 or so minutes, I will come back and we'll talk about a few more things. So Continue dumping your questions in here. I will come back and answer your questions at the end, but I'm not going to interrupt the video to answer those. And Timothy can't see him. He did this on Monday. So yeah, if you have questions, you can put them in. He might be watching and I'll try to answer them at the end. But with no further ado, -do, here's uh, Timothy Ha and I. Okay. So yeah, thank you for doing this. First of all, I'm excited to, uh, to chat with you and hear what you got to say about EQ. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're a very proficient user of EQ. You and I have talked about this a lot, that you you spend a lot of time and use that as one of your main tools for kind of sculpting your tone. What, what are kind of overall thoughts on EQ and, and how do you like to use it? Well, um, a little bit of background. You know, I've played uh, in churches direct with in-ears. I've, you know, played in bands with amps on stage. I've engineered live. I have uh, done studio production. Um, mixing, mastering. Um, so I've kind of touched on, you know, all the major scenarios, you know, where EQ and processing are, are used. So that's, you know, a little bit of my pedigree. Um, but a lot of my thoughts on EQ uh, come from uh, my experience in the studio and how I applied that to live stage. Um, uh, in mixing, studio two biggest tools compression and eq i would spend more time and more energy 
using those two tools before I touch anything else, bar none. Um, those two things will do the most to shape uh, your tone, place instruments in the mix, um, bring it forwards or backwards, um, give you the sense of space even more than, um, you know, reverb, delay, any other effects you might use. These two things have the most significant impact on how things are going to sound and uh, how a, a full mix is going to sound. So yeah, it's, they're it's uh, a, absolutely like critical. They're like hugely important tools that I think a lot of people skip because they're not as sexy as like reverbs and distortions and all that. They're like, oh, I'll, I'll get to that EQ and all that stuff later without realizing that if you get it right at the front end, then the rest of it actually does become more fun. Yep, yep. It's it's the tire rotation and oil change of music production. They're They're boring. They're not fun. But without those two things, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Very true. That's a great analogy. I'm totally stealing that, by the way. So um, I'd say as far as the basics go, in a live situation, studio situation, um, EQ early, EQ as often as you possibly can. Um, I know if you're using a traditional pedal board, um, you know, space is a factor. Um, I remember at one point I had two dedicated EQ pedals on my board in addition to the, um, the EQ built into my preamp and then another EQ built into a separate processor. But I had let's see, this um, Boss GE7. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's been modified to uh, have... It's got different op amps and capacitors to reduce the noise because it's kind of a uh, noisy pedal. Right. But at a gig, especially a new gig in with a new band or in a new venue, absolutely uh, indispensable. I would not uh, go to a gig without that in my bag because it's kind of say your pedal board, you know, your tone is already you know in the sweet spot and everything sounds the way you want it, but you've never been in this bar before or concert hall or wherever, and things are gonna need adjustment. You know, it's just a fact of life. And I would say that type of EQ, the graphic EQ with the physical sliders on it, that's probably the most useful for those emergency Band-Aid EQ tunings. If you need to make a quick change, done, done. Right. Too low, too high, no problem. Absolutely. Yeah, so super fast if you don't have you a graphic EQ. Visualize the whole thing, whereas parametrics kind of like you got to look at it and study it. Like, what exactly am I doing here? Right. Yeah. Right. This is very intuitive. Um, you can plug it in and have your fix within seconds. Uh, the first EQ, always. Don't forget this. Um, my my Jensen does not have this, but my Wave has a tone knob. So uh, tone knob, first EQ, use it. Um, after that, uh, now this depends on your your uh, pedal board setup, what kind of effects you're using. I use a Helix or a HX Stomp. If you have the option, your next EQ should be a high pass to cut off all your low end and then a low pass to cut off all your high end. Now, with the setup that I have, what I use is an, a, uh, a 60 hertz high pass and my low pass is set at uh, 12 and a half kilohertz.
so yeah, that's that's the bare basics of how I use EQ. Um, currently in my patches, I don't have a lot of additional EQ that's like a standalone EQ block. Um, the delays in the HX have a little bit of pass filtering. I believe the reverbs have a little bit of pass filtering. And those are also very important tools, um, which I'll talk about later. But as far as how I will place effects, um, your tone knob, your initial pass filtering, and then any additional EQing, that can be really placed anywhere in your signal chain. Um, as I said before, EQ early and EQ often. If you have three EQ pedals, you can make good use of three EQ pedals. Um, if you have a digital processor like the HX Helix, the ME90, um, I'm not sure how the EQ is set up in that, but many of these multi-effects processors will allow you to place quite a few instances of whatever e uh, process you're using. Yep. Now, the rule of thumb in uh, studio production is Subtractive EQ is the way to go anytime you're doing just your base tonal adjustments. And the reason for this is um, EQ is a gain adjustment. Mm -hmm. So you are taking this narrow band of your frequencies. You are either applying gain to it or you are cutting gain to it. And as you know, as you discussed last week, a gain adjustment is a tone adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, if you bring up the gain on a certain band early in your chain, and then you boost the volume later on down the line, you're going to hear that gain, you're going to hear that noise. So even if you're boosting, say, 120 hertz by 6 dB, if it sounds clean there, you add volume or gain later on down the line, you're going to hear that, mm -hmm. and it's going to come through as overdrive now whether or not you want that overdrive is you know purely a creative question but it's it's a tool to be used but it's also something to watch out for mm -hmm. so, and then how do you feel jump. about how do you feel about bandwidth are you like a are you sort of a boost broad and cut narrow guy or where do you like to do those types of uh things how wide of a queue are you using um I would always start with very broadband boosts and cuts. And if it's not doing what it needs to do for you, take that broadband and narrow it down a little bit. If you have a parametric EQ, you can raise the Q adjustment to narrow that band. Um, if you are having a problem with feedback, especially if you're playing an acoustic violin, if you're having issues with feedback, you can, what we do is call it a, a Q sweep. You would raise, oh, let's see, you would raise the Q, mm -hmm. raise the gain, yep. and then sweep that frequency until you get to where it's really pinging and feeding back a lot. And then you can raise the Q a little bit more to narrow it down and then cut it. And if it gets, if that gets rid of your feedback, then you found your problem frequency. And that's what we call a notch filter. Yep. Um, um, a lot of preamps have a notch filter, which is a preset cue, but you can sweep the frequency and raise or lower the gain on that to get rid of any feedback problems. Yeah, you can always tell the inexperienced guys with the 31 bands, when something's feeding back, they start notching to see if they make it go away. The experienced guys actually start boosting each one and then pulling it back. And, w and if it was feeding back this much, and then I find that frequency and it's like, woo, and then it takes off when I raise that frequency, I found it. And then you can notch that one out. Because otherwise you pull one down and you go, well, did that help? I don't know. Well, okay, leave it. Pull the next one down. And the next thing you know, you don't have any gain at all. You know, another thing that I wanted to talk about was energy in the mix. And... Um... This might be kind of like a foreign way of thinking of it, but mix energy is basically, if you look at the volume 
the overall level in a mix. What you're looking at is a quantity of energy. And the way energy works on the EQ curve, it is a, I believe it's a reverse exponential curve, where if you have your low frequency on this end and your high frequency on this end, that logarithmic curve is going to come from the low end with lots of energy. And then as you move further up the frequency spectrum, your, the amount of energy carried by every frequency is going to come down to that almost nothing. Right. Now, why is this important to know? Well, it's important because this being your entire EQ spectrum, your 60 hertz to your 20 kilohertz, that's everything that humans are going to be able to hear. So front of house is looking at the gain meter on your channel. And if it's peaking into the red, he's going to bring your gain down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, and like you said, a lot of the energy comes from those lower frequencies. So if I'm using my high pass judicially and I'm cutting a lot of those useless low frequencies out of there, then I'm actually sending a stronger signal, all my mids and highs, which are what you can hear with a violin, those are coming yep. through stronger than they would be. So if your engineer's like, dude, I can't get you out here. I'm peeking you out, but I still can't hear you. It could be because you're sending too much low frequency stuff that nobody's going to hear anyway. And if you cut that mm -hmm. out, and it's crazy that if you cut that out, you end up sending a stronger signal to front of house. It's a little counterintuitive. Right. And the, the compressor on the front of house board, it doesn't, it doesn't hear what you're playing. It senses the amount of energy you're sending to the board. Exactly. And that's why this is so important. The more energy I can cut out from that 20, 20 hertz to 60 hertz or 20 hertz to 100 hertz, that is a massive amount of sonic energy. The more of that that I can ruffle up and get rid of, now I've got 60 hertz to 20k hertz. And that is, I would say probably, if I were to send that through a pink noise generator, that's probably less than half of the sonic energy that you were originally sending to the board. Yeah, that's sure. less work that your compressor is doing. And now, all those subsonic frequencies that you can't even hear, the compressor was hearing that and compressing it anyway. But guess what? That was also compressing your 60 to 20K, which means every time you like bump your violin, oh, that's sending a low end spike. 40 hertz, can't hear it. Compressor, doesn't care. Compressing you anyway, you know? So cut all that low end energy out. Your compressor is now going to hear these nice mids to high frequencies. And it's going to say, oh, this isn't bothering me at all. So we can give you more gain. You're going to have less noise. It's not going to compress you and bury you in the mix. So it's a win-win. And all it takes is adjusting that, that high pass frequency. Yeah, the frequency spectrum runs from 20 hertz or 20 cycles per second to 20,000 hertz or 20,000 cycles per second. If we were to work from 20,000 all the way down, I would say, 20,000 hertz, that's your audible high limit. That is a dog whistle. Some people can hear it. Maybe. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I sure can at this point. Um, and then we go down to 10 kilohertz. Now, this I've labeled as air, space, and bow noise. Yeah. Um, that's a real... That breathy, just that frosting. Like if you're in a room with a violinist, you can hear all the sound coming off of their bow. You can hear stuff that you wouldn't hear in a recording. Um, some people might not think that's important. I am a lot of classic electric violin recordings. They don't have anything between 8 and 10 kilohertz, maybe even 
five and 10 kilohertz. That's true. Um, That's what gives them sort of that duller sound. Right. And, but for me, I've always felt that having that in there was extremely important to putting the violin in the room and giving it that character that vocalist, guitarist, they're not going to be able to, to convey that the way a violin would. So I think it's extremely important to have. Um, so next we have five kilohertz and I call that the presence. So that's kind of 5k is where it kind of gets into your face and i'm not really sure how else to explain that but that's just <laughs> yeah that's just the impression that i get you know you boost 5k and it's gonna mm-hmm. it's kind of come up yeah it, gets, it, come it up right of pushes up. it at you yeah exactly yep um and then next coming down from that 2.5 kilohertz, that's known as the singing frequency. That's kind of the most prominent frequency in uh, vocals. I'd say between two and a half to one kilohertz, those are your noticeability ranges. That's what's going to jump out of the mix. And the reason for this is biological, actually. Humans, our ears are attuned to pay attention to the vocal range because that's how we speak to each other. And this is also the reason why it's so important for violinists because we play a lot of vocal range lines, um, four string violin occupies mostly two and a half to one kilohertz in the fundamentals, and it's most prominent in those fundamentals. So that's why it's very important to pay attention to those frequencies. Um, Yeah, people with hearing loss, if they've lost some hearing in that one to three K range, they'll tell people like, I can hear you. I just can't understand anything you're saying. That's where all intelligibility is. It's sort of where our consonants all hit. And that's, yeah, that's where, at least in English, that's where the, the, the sounds that we make are really distinct. And that's sort of where we separate like a T from a a Z. That's it's in that one to three K range. Yep. So the next one down from that, I've uh, marked 300 Hertz. And that's what I would call the fullness range. That's where you kind of kind of start to get that low end fullness and ooh that feels like a that feels like a real instrument yep. you know I can kind of feel that moving in the room um, 150 Hertz I would call that the richness range So now you've got the body, you've got the high end, it's in your face. Um, 150 hertz is like kind of 
feel that coming up from down low, you know, okay, so that's, that's like a larger bodied instrument. That's, you know, kind of feel it kind of moving some air at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that goes down to 60 Hertz, which is technically the lowest audible. And it, in most cases, it doesn't make sense to lower your high pass below 60 Hertz. Right. Um, but we're going to keep on going. So take that for what it's worth. Um, yeah, that's also 20. where your bow thump is. When you change directions with your with your bow hand, if you really listen to your acoustic instruments, you can hear that thump if you sort of listen to the string. But your acoustic body can't push that frequency out. Your pickup can. So when you change right. string when you change string direction, you hear that. Pup, 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 pup. That's but usually between fifty and eighty hertz. So I actually mm -hmm. like that sound. If that sound bothers you then you know, that 50 to 80 hertz range, you can dump that and get rid of a, a, a big chunk of that bow thump that you get. Right. In the studio, you might want to let those those 60 hertz frequencies come through and let the engineer deal with it in mm -hmm. post-production. But for a live situation, um, I'd say it's very rare that they're going to say, hey, can you um, bring some of your low end up a little bit more? You know, uh, you know, it's it's just something to keep in mind, really. So, uh, so that's sixty hertz. Anything from sixty to twenty, that's uh, that's your bouncer frequencies. That's the one that's gonna come up and hit you in the chest. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, depending on the type of system you're running, type of subs that they have in the room, if you've got stuff happening in the sixty to twenty hertz range, audience is not gonna hear it, but they will feel it. Yeah, I think this is going to be super, super helpful for people to just have an idea of when I see a number, what does that number really tell me? Um, and then, of course, yep. each one of those ranges, it's we talked last week about Goldilocks, about too much signal, too little signal, and just right. Each one of these frequency ranges, we got the Goldilocks issue, too, because every one of those frequency ranges is a double-edged sword. So like you said, the 150, I think you said, was like your fullness or your, your sort of, what was the word you used for the 150 range? of richness yeah that richness so we can oh we want to deck that richness we definitely want a lot of richness right so the right amount of richness is great too little richness obviously that's poorness we don't like poorness but you can have too much richness and then it just becomes mud these frequency ranges as a double-edged sword too much is bad too little is bad we're trying to find that sweet spot in the middle yep exactly Dude, thank you so much. Ton of wisdom there. Thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, clearly you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. You and I have spent a lot of time talking about it too. So yeah, yeah it's thanks great for having to get me. you on tape and, and get you out to, uh, to the world so they can share some of that. All right. That was a lot of fun. Thank you, Timothy, for doing that. He is here, as you can see on the Facebook side in the comments section, uh, answering questions and making some comments there. So um, yeah, thanks again for doing that, Timothy. And if you guys have questions, uh, you can reach out to him on on the socials as well. Uh, super smart guy who absolutely knows what he's talking about. Um, I did want to say that we didn't get to this, and it's and it's partially because I know Timothy uses uh, a lot of impulse responses, as do I, um, and and I haven't really dealt as much with this piezo quack uh, since I started using impulse responses, but. Most electric string instruments, pretty much all of these are using piezo pickups. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We can get into some other time. But it's a known issue with piezos is that dreaded piezo quack that people uh, will sometimes complain about. And where is that quack? It kind of depends on the pickup and where it's placed in the instrument, which exact piezo crystal they're using. But it's usually between 2.5K and 5K. If you have that sort of sound in your electric violin and you, that's really bugging you, one of the things you can do is try to find exactly where that is in that two to five K range and cut that pretty aggressively. Uh, I mean, you could come down 15 Hertz or 15 Hertz, 15 decibels in that, in that range where you find it and just sort of 
monkey around with your with your uh, your bandwidth and all that until you find that quack. But it's going to be in that 2.5 to 5K range. And you can go after it pretty hard and get rid of a fair amount of that um, of that quack. So uh, I did see a couple of comments I wanted to get to. Let's see, there was one here that's kind of off topic. Um, where did I find this? I'm looking, 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 sorry. Um, yeah, this one. So yeah, Malovi, I think that's how you say your name. If you can send us an email at info at electricviolinshop.com and ask whatever question you've got, uh, I'm happy to try to do that. It's kind of off topic. I don't have one set up and, and any of that right now. Um, but uh, yeah, just kind of let us know what do you, what you're looking for there. Andy, good to see you, man. Yeah, the high pass and low pass filters, man, getting rid of all those frequency ranges that you're not going to be using, that can make a huge difference in your sound. Um, and then Timothy made a comment here. It's important to, to note how boosting and cutting some of these frequency bands affect how the instrument, yeah, responds, even when the fundamentals in a different range. That's very right. Um, EQ is one of those tools that man, I wish there was a shortcut to it. There's not. It really, it's just going to take time messing around with stuff and trying to figure it out. Uh, since a number of you guys are here, I've got set up to do a thing. Let me see if this works. I'm going to come over to here and uh, I've got a, I've got this set up to do some EQ messing around. Let's see if we can start this. So yeah, let's let's start messing here and see what happens. So, so generally I said with my high pass, I will run that up until it starts digging into my sound in a way that I don't like it. So your <coughs> excuse me, your your lowest fundamental on a on a four string instrument, I think is 196. On a five string, I think is 165 or somewhere in there. So generally that's kind of where I would start. So I would probably put my high pass at like 150 or so. And then these first few notes I'm playing on the C string. And let's let's kind of mess with those notes right there. Let's see if we can tighten this range up. Um pull this in here. Wow, that's really long. Um Let's see if we can pull this and just sort of loop this first section. So remember we said that this is a roll off. It's not a brick wall. And you're like, wow, you're high passing all the way up to almost 300 Hertz. I can still hear that C string. Yeah, you can, you can still hear, especially the overtones there. Um, and it might be one of the things that Timothy and I talked about that it didn't make the cut in the video was that context matters. If I'm playing unaccompanied violin and, um, and it's just me, I'm probably going to leave all this stuff in. I'm probably going to cut this way back to here. Right. So. But if I'm in a string section and there's a bunch of us, maybe I've got a cellist in there too. And that cellist needs access to those lower frequencies and I'm just in their way. So maybe that's going to clean that up a little bit. Um, and hopefully that makes, that makes sense to you. So that's, that's what I mean about sweeping this. I will sort of sweep this high pass filter until it starts biting into my tone. So there's still a lot of there's still a lot of violin sound there even with this high pass at 500 hertz. I probably wouldn't high pass it that high, but it it hasn't gotten too wacky sounding yet. And we've dumped a ton of those low frequencies. If I'm playing first violin in something and I'm trying to really open up some space for the viola and the cello below me, I could see myself doing this. Yeah, maybe this player's playing mostly A and E string. It's going to be you know, up in this range. So 
So that's that's not the end of the world if we're high past that high, right? So let's pull this down. Usually I would keep it somewhere in this range. Just like Timothy said, we're getting rid of all that low end energy. And we were showing how much energy those low frequencies take up. Um, and, and with especially if you're using a pickup, you're going to see when you change bow directions, you're going to see a ton of that low end sound down there that you can't really hear. All it's doing is sucking power and muddying up your mix. Just EQ it out. It's going to make things a lot better. Uh, 130 hertz. Thank you. So let's uh, let's mess with some other frequencies here. Um, let's mess with the, uh, some of these higher frequencies. Uh, so let's put this back here. Let's run this one now. We'll turn this on and run this down. Oh, what happened there? Weirdness. All right. So that got pretty dull, right? We, we're cutting down here to about 2K. That's getting real dull. We kind of lose all the air. Um, one of, I noticed one of the examples I didn't give, uh, audio examples I didn't give when Timothy was talking, he was talking about uh, above 10K, there's really not a lot of useful information. Let's listen. So yeah, you can, I don't, especially on my computer speakers, I'm not hearing, uh, I'm not hearing any difference there on my, um, on my computer speakers. <coughs> uh, yeah, it would. That's a good point, Timothy. Let me, uh, let me see. Um, all right, let's put a compressor on here. Change this to a compressor. Just for funsies. All right, there's the compressor. Let's make that a little smaller. Put that over here. We'll make this a little smaller. All right. Make sure we can still see all that. Yes, we can. All right. So you can see the compressor is just starting to hit a little bit. If you if you look at that knob, that's kind of do the the dial that's doing this. That's where the compressor is just starting to cut. So let's come in here and run this up. Run this up, you know, about here where we're not hearing much difference in the sound, but I bet we'll see that compressor not move nearly as much. Oh, I've got it after <laughs> I've got it in front of the EQ. There we go. That's why I wasn't doing that. You got to put the compressor after the EQ or the EQ won't affect it. I don't know. I don't know if that showed what I wanted to show or not. That's the problem with live TV. I don't know. 
are we on TV? Um, so yeah, he is right that at a front of house compressor, if I'm dumping all the low frequencies out of there and, um, and I'm pulling all that energy out that my front of house compressor is definitely going to act a lot different than, uh, it would if I was leaving all those low frequencies in there. Um, let's see what sort of frequencies do we want to check out next? Um, let's see. We did the high pass and the low pass. Let's check out some of these. This is one that I kind of like to work in this range. And again, I like to cut and I like to cut kind of broad. So let's cut some, let's kind of some mud out of here. So what, what you're hearing when I keep turning that on and off, you may, you may think that when it's by itself, wow, it sounds fuller without that little dish in there. But I've been doing this long enough to know that, that with that dish in there, it is going to lay in a mix so much nicer. Because one of the things that we're trying to figure out in a mix as a front of house engineer, when I'm trying to put a mix together, I'm trying to make sure that there's space for everybody in the mix. Like I need to know that I've got room for everybody in this mix. And that's a place where a lot of my vocal lines are going to be sitting right where I've got that dished out. And if the violin is trying to occupy that space, the vocals can't. And the only way for me to get the violins and the vocals to both be able to lay nice is to turn one of them down. So I can, I'm not going to turn the vocal down because it's a pop band or a rock band or whatever. We're not turning the vocal down. That's the last thing that's going to happen. So if I can't get the violin and the vocal to lay nice, I'm going to have to pull the violin down. So instead of pulling the whole violin down, I can pull out that sort of middle range right there, makes room for the vocal, and then the violin is going to have the space on either side of that vocal. If it's a four string violin, it's pretty much above. Uh, those of us are extended range people, we can go above or below. So you have to, the, one of the things that we talked about, like I said, that didn't make the cut on the video was context. And the context is going to matter a lot. If you were a solo violinist, you're probably going to leave that mid range in there because it's some nice fullness. If you are in a mix and you're trying to share space with other instruments, guitars and pianos, especially if a piano player can not figure out how to take their foot off the sustain pedal, they start generating generating a lot of mud in that middle area. Uh, I will start cutting the piano in that area. I will also start cutting other things in that area to just get away from this big ball of muddy mids so that my mix has just got all this mid pressure in it. It's not any good. Um, so that's a thing that we can do to try to clean up that violin sound a lot. Again, we're always trying to cut these things rather than boost, but one tool you can use to hear what it's doing is we're, we're cutting at that frequency. Let's boost and see what happens. Okay. So those are some of the experiments that you're going to have to run. And I can't do all these for you. Uh, we're going to run out of time, but I would suggest doing some of those experiments on your own, taking your signal. One of the best things you can do is record yourself and then just start, start messing with your, um, with your sound, you know, try to, try to, 
figure out what you can do with it. And that way, if you're doing this at home, you're not going to have the, the same kind of pressure that you're trying to do this live. Now, if you're trying to take the EQ curves that you're messing with at home and translate, translate those to live, we got more stuff to talk about. Uh, because what you're hearing on your studio monitors at home at 70 or 80 dB is not going to be what you're going to hear on your band speakers live at 100 dB. It's going to be radically different. So, um, you know, these when you're going to do EQ on your signal for what you're going to play live, you want to do it as much as you can on the speakers that you're going to use at the volume that you're going to be at and in the context that you're gonna be in. So these are things that usually when I'm playing for an engineer that I haven't played for before, after sound check, I will always go talk to that engineer and say, hey, uh, just for my information, what did you have to do to my signal to make it lay right in that mix? Because if I hear three or four of them say in a row, hey, we really have to cut a lot of 2K, well then I'm probably just gonna cut 2K out of my board. And that way um, I can sort of get the information from those engineers. If, if they're saying, one of them saying, well, I had to boost uh, 1K and the next week they're saying, no, I had to cut 1K. Well, that's probably just the room, right? Or it's their personal preference. But if I'm hearing the same thing over and over, then that probably means that I need to make an adjustment in my board. Um, all right, so let's go to... Let me see scenes. Here we go. And sorry, I'm trying to remember all this stuff. Um, this one, I boost. I don't generally boost. Uh, and maybe it could be. That's a YEV that's plugged straight into a, a board. Um, so that's not my personal favorite sound in the world. I usually like something a lot of meteor. Um, but yeah, if the, and that's the other thing about tone. It's, it's really personal. It's really personal. So if you, if that's what it sounds like to you, like it needs some, some boost in the one five, I would, you know, ideally I would cut some things around that first and see if that helps. Um, or yeah, you could, that's pretty surgical what you're talking about, like a, a four Q. Uh, yeah, I would, I might try a little boost in that area and see if it helps you. Um, on my little computer speakers, these things are pretty tinny to begin with. It certainly didn't sound like it needed any help in those upper ranges there, but on better speakers, yeah, that might be exactly what you're hearing. Um, yeah, so talking about equipment, yes, Rob, that stuff is fantastic stuff. I think you and, and Timothy were both talking about some pieces of equipment that you guys dig. I do everything in my Helix, so I don't have to mess with any of that. Um, this is the one, yes, Fletcher Munson, uh, Rob knows all this physics. When we're talking about the um, being able to hear, hearing something at 70 dB and hearing something at 100 dB are two very different things. I do want to do a video on that at some point. Um, and then the other thing is make sure you're playing it on the gear that you're going to be playing it on because speakers are not linear either. Your speakers are going to sound different at 80 dB than they sound at 100 and your little studio monitors are going to sound different than the speakers that your band is using because it's likely your band speakers are using 12s or 15s for the horns. I'd be very surprised if you had 12 or 15 inch, uh, if you had 12 or 15 inch drivers in your home studio. Uh, oh yeah, here's another en entire discussion. Dynamic EQ. Woo! Yeah, so this might be another week for us to do. It might be worth talking about dynamic EQ in another week. Dynamic EQ is kind of where EQ and compression meet each other. Um, so uh, compression is when we're shrinking the dy dynamic, the, I can't talk, shrinking the dynamic range of a signal. Uh, we'll set a threshold and then above that threshold, say if I use a two to one ratio, if I've exceeded the threshold by two dB, but I'm using a two to one threshold or a two to one ratio, then instead of going above the threshold by 2 dB, it's going to squash it 1 dB. And if I've set a threshold at a 2 to 1 ratio, and I exceed the threshold by 10 dB, it's going to squash it by 5. Does that make sense? So, but that's your entire signal. That's the whole signal. 
is what it's looking at. It's not looking at frequency by frequency. A dynamic EQ, you set it to look at a specific frequency range. And I will say that, okay, between 1K and 5K, I can set a threshold and a ratio there and you don't touch anything else. And I will often use that for female singers. For some reason, when female singers start to push, there's about a 4K, it's a very, very common thing, that in 4K, that boy, do they start getting re like a lot. And 4K is, is a very, it's a uh, frequency that's very intelligible, but it's also really annoying. And so a, a lot of times, especially if that's not a you know, super well-trained singer, they'll start getting like stabby in that 4K range. And I don't want to pull down any of the other stuff. I just want to pull down that 4K. So I'll use a dynamic EQ on that singer. And I'll say this range right here, as she starts getting louder, you got to start pulling just that range, just that three to 5K, you got to start pulling that down. Um, and that's going to be in the, that would be in your soundboard out front. Um, my EQ in the Helix floor, I use the, uh, I use the parametric, just the standard parametric EQ, and I've been able to get it to do whatever I want it to do. Um, yeah, so multiband compression, which is essentially the marriage of EQ and compression. It is a very powerful tool. It's hard to find live. Yeah, it is hard to find live outside of like really good boards. Uh, I drive a Yamaha CL5 at my church and it's got uh, multi-band compression in there, dynamic uh, compression. It's really nice. Um, <clears throat> okay, awesome. Good information. Thank you. Um, I don't do any of my own like final mixing and mastering. I send all that stuff off. Uh, Matt Vanacoro does an amazing job on that for me. Um, so I don't have to do any of that. I do, I do a lot of live engineering, but not a lot of... Um, I engineer all my own studio stuff, but I don't mix and master it. And, ooh, that's kind of baller. Matt Manweiler, what's happening, man? Dynamic EQ and compression. Yeah, the, the, the folks that are really digging into this stuff, that is a really fantastic tool. Um, static EQ, I guess, is the opposite of dynamic EQ. Um, is a very, very, very powerful tool especially high pass, I find, okay, here's another, uh, let's go to this. Um, let's come, here we go. I will say, here's one of my general rules. If I find myself doing a lot with EQ, um, I would, outside of drums and vocals, I generally feel like I have a source problem. So when I'm mixing, a lot of times, especially because I'm fortunate enough to work with really good players, I use a high pass and I use a high pass very aggressively on most things. You'll see vocals high passed at 500 on my board. And that's, that's fine. It sounds good out front. Don't worry about how I got there. Just be glad I did. Um, I will high pass vocals as high as maybe 500 Hertz. Uh, again, not a brick wall. And then between a high pass and a fader, man, I can probably get 90% of the sound that I want out of a mix using nothing but high passes and faders. Uh, a little bit of compression sometimes. If you're working with good players and you're working with people who know how to mic up their stuff and you're working with people who know how to get good tone out of their instrument, you don't have to do that much in a lot of cases. If I find myself doing a lot with EQ, other than like some, some cuts here and there, um, then I generally feel like I've got a source problem. So look at your source. Like Timothy said, the first thing on the first stage of EQ is, I don't know why I'm doing this. It's the tone knob on your violin. So make sure that your source is good. And Timothy may have some things to say about that. He may disagree with me on the, if you're doing a ton of EQ, you generally have a source problem. But my experience is, even on drums, if I'm doing a lot of really wicked EQ on drums, uh, Maybe I'm going to talk to my drummer about, hey, can you tune that thing? And, you know, if they'll spend some time tuning that drum and I can get a 57 or something pretty much right on it, I really don't have to EQ it a whole lot. They just sound right. So, um, all right. Yeah, we got lots of stuff coming in here. Um, 
yes, it is amazing how much flatter your EQ gets with experience. It is. Um, uh, I'm reading all this. Very cool. Awesome. Oh, good. We agree on something. <laughs> he and I disagree on a lot of things, which is why I invited him to be here. I think we agree on a lot of the fundamental things. We kind of disagree on some of the, uh, like, how do you get there from here? And and I love that. I love having people that, I'd, that I've got some disagreements with because I don't have the only way of doing things. I definitely don't have the best way of doing things. I certainly don't have the only way of doing things. And I don't want it to present, I don't want to present to you guys like, Hey, Matt Bell says that this is the only way to do it. But don't, oh my God, don't take that from anything I say. Um, so yeah, I love bringing in people that that like will look at things differently than I do because I'm learning a ton of stuff too. I, I think the best teaching happens when the teachers are learning at the same time and the students are. So um, man, this is a really fun discussion. I'm enjoying this a lot, but we've been here almost an hour and a half and my voice is going to fall completely out of my body. Um so I'm going to sign off in a few minutes next week. I have not decided which effect we're doing next week. Um, and it might, uh, I don't know. We'll come up with something. We'll do an effect next week. And, and we are, uh, yeah. So hopefully you guys are digging this series. Uh, we had to do a little bit of housekeeping before we started getting into any of the, the interesting effects. I think this discussion shows that EQ is incredibly interesting. Uh, but between gain staging and EQ, like Timothy said, those are kind of the tire change, uh, tire rotational oil change of effects. Like they're not all exciting, but you do have to do them. And if you do them well, then, you know, putting the money into the radio is actually going to mean something in the car, right? You know, you can put a cool spoiler on the back, but if you're sitting on the side of the road because your engine blew up because you didn't change the oil, then nobody cares what that spoiler looks like. Um, you can tell like where I grew up, Detroit. So anyway, thank you guys so much for hanging out and uh, really enjoyed this discussion with y'all. Thank you, Timothy, again, for all your expertise on that. Uh, Rob and, and DGS and uh, Sasha and Matt Manweiler and Andy, all you guys. Thank you guys for all the awesome comments. And uh, yeah, have a great Thanksgiving. Look forward to seeing you guys next week. And we'll talk. I don't know which effect we'll talk about, but we'll talk about some sort of effect. We'll be all effecty be affected. I'm going to affect a accent here. So good boy. Hey. <laughs>